welcome to Florescene. Hi everyone, I'm here with Giselle Tabrizi Poor, fashion frame designer extraordinaire and founder of Giselle Eyewear, artistic designer eyewear handmade in Japan and designed by Giselle in Roswell, Georgia. Giselle is a licensed optician who earned her optician opticianry degree with honors from Georgia Piedmont College in 2008. Shortly after graduation, she opened her luxury eye care boutique, Atlanta Vision Optical. She opened her second boutique and corporate headquarters in Roswell, Georgia, Giselle Eye Care, in 2017. And Giselle is a film, lens tech, and eyewear designer and has worked in movies and television alongside some of the biggest actors as their personal contact lens technician. Actors such as Jason Momoa, Norman Reedus, John Bernthal, John Malkovich, Michael Douglas, Sylvester Stallone, Chris Pratt, Will Poulter, and Rosario Dawson, just to name a few, and has worked on many films such as Ant-Man, Guardians of the Galaxy 2 and 3, The Walking Dead, Venom, Avengers, Teen Wolf, and Spider-Man. And you can check out Gazelle's credits on imdb.com. How many people in our industry can say that? That is so awesome. So welcome. Thanks for being here. And congratulations on all this success. Now, I went through your designs online. And actually, I, I was going to stop into your office one time. I'm in Atlanta all the time. I'll do it next time, I promise. But um, they're truly works of art. So the industry ap appreciates these beautiful works of art and eyewear. And you've taken a lot of pride in providing form in terms of beauty, obviously. Just look at them and you could tell. But you also emphasize function. Can you tell us about your original concept for the eyewear and what makes it so unique? Absolutely. So one of my biggest things um, in life in general is to have pride in what, what I do, regardless of what it is I'm doing. And so when it came to eyewear, I wanted to have something very luxurious. However, I wanted the functionality to be there. So it took a few years of engineering, designing, um, and going back and forth between manufacturing and just innovation uh, to get to where we got to with these um, products. When you pick up one of our eyewears, you'll feel the luxuriness, but you'll feel how light it is. And then the next thing you'll feel is the durability. Um, I can break just about anything in life. So I wanted to have something that was beautiful, but at the same time, it actually had function behind it as well. Well, that's neat. You know, I guess being a licensed optician still, and prior to that, and you appreciate those features that we all do as, as people who own opticals and serve patients with these products. You've had at least two notable professional transitions. First, your transition to frame designer. And second, your work in film and television. Yes, sir. Tell me about what inspired you to transition from retail optician to frame designer to the stars and what you were feeling when the dream to work in the entertainment industry became a reality, I guess. That's what I'm wondering. Exactly what it is. Uh, the dream did become a reality. Um, I was around eight or nine years old when I decided that I love glasses. I was wearing them for a long time um, and I wanted to create them. So I started doing uh, little sketches of eyewear as I was uh, growing up. And as I came to Georgia to go to school for opticianry, um, when we opened our practice, I decided that I really want to design. And the idea was to design for a big company because I never ever imagined that I could do it for myself. And my husband was a huge key in that um, aspect of my life. He said, you know, why not? Why not we create our own eyewear? And so we began that process. We knew that we wanted to have certain things, certain elements of it, and Japan was the best place to create that. Um, we did not get to flourish into that until uh, I got one phone call to start working on Teen Wolf as a contact lens technician. And while I was on set, I was designing glasses and sketching, and the actors just started asking me about that. And uh, Norman Reedus actually gave me my first initial design and allowed me to create something for him. And from there, it went down and went all the way down to becoming a designer and working in films. And honestly, I've never even put a single resume in the film industry. It's been word of mouth, and I've been very fortunate to work with some incredible people to make my dreams come true. I, I always say, you know, if you're there, if you fill an unmet need first, you basically cement yourself in these positions and opportunities come flying at you. So congrats on that. Wonderful. And some designers, I know, base their designs on latest trends, but I read about you that you base your designs on the inspirations in your life. Tell us about that and tell us what some of those inspirations are. 
Absolutely. Um, my patients, my husband, my child, uh, they have all been a big part of what I create. The names will come after certain books that I've read, uh, Sherlock Holmes and uh, things of that sort. But the inspiration of the I work comes from mostly with my patients and uh, the careers that they have, you know, depending on what they're looking for. They're looking for a pair of glasses to wear on the computer, however they want it to be lightweight and they want different aspects to it. So I took all of those inputs and put them in different I Words, to to catch a niche, the niche that they needed at that time. And it turned out that a lot more people actually needed that as well. So it worked out really well. But yeah. when it comes to design, we definitely don't look forward to what the fashion is, more of what can we create, what elements can we put into this eyewear that we're not recreating the wheel, we're just making it better. So like most artists, your inspiration comes to you on a whim, uh, can come to you during work when you're inspired by something a patient says or a need they have, uh, anything happen in the middle of the night that you have to jot down? Absolutely. That actually happens quite a bit when it comes to like dreams or when I've been thinking about something all day. I'm a multitasker to say the least. So even though if I'm working with a patient or if I'm on set with an actor, I'm actually still thinking about what else could be done. Like, oh, wow, this person's particular you know bridge on their nose man they would if they just had three more millimeters and if we curved it this way it would make it better some of our designs for example um the mac and frame has a much larger it's an acetate frame but it has a longer nose piece and it's so you can heat it to move it in and out so if you have different types of fits you can fit someone that doesn't have a bridge like me and bring it in and if you have someone like my husband that has a wider bridge we can go ahead and heat it and move it along. So it makes more functional sense for opticians, optometrists, as well as patients and actors. As someone with no bridge almost, I, I can appreciate that. <laughs> now, the, it's, we talk about bridge a lot, but I, the ergonomics of your temple designs gets a lot of attention as well. Tell, tell our audience what makes yours different and what was behind the concept for that. Absolutely. So I was raised in Florida for the most part. And so I used to go fishing with my father all the time. Biggest problem with fishermen is that we put the glasses on, we look down to see what we caught and it goes in the water. So I wanted something that was going to wrap around my head and not have it fall um, or break or anything like that. But the problem is when you do that, it actually starts putting a lot of pressure in back of the skull and it hurts your head and gives you sinus pressures and so on and so forth. So it took about five years for me to design the temple that I did, the temple end piece um, for the Wicked Collection, for it to reside above your bones and not to give that hard hit in back of the skull to make that pressure so you don't get headaches, you don't get nausea, you don't get all the things that comes along with it. And when you put your head down, it doesn't fall. But at the same time, you can wear it for 15, 17 hours without having to constantly either take it off or um, tighten it of a sort. Oh, that's great. I, I really am looking forward today to talking about Seiko, but I have just two more questions about that, about things mm -hmm. I read about the frames. Tell, I'm interested in learning what's special about Japanese titanium. Absolutely. It is extremely durable. It is extremely, it's beautifully made as well. And also just the feel of it. So the weight will be different. The durability will be different. And then the, they actually take just as much pride as I do in my job. So everything to the last bit, to the tip of it will be precise, fluid. So it differs from the titanium we see in our typical titanium frames. In my personal opinion, absolutely. I think a lot of our patients have noticed it. And it's it's that instant reaction of putting it on. And the first thing people say, they look at it, it looks pretty. They put it on, they go, oh, wow, that comfort. And they always reach back to the back of their head. Um, so that was one of my favorite parts of creating this eyewear for people to notice it without me actually mentioning it. That's neat. That's neat. The thing that really grabbed my attention was that, I, I don't know if it's just your men's eyewear, but you... you you have leather temples, and I'm really intrigued by that. I can see how that would be comfortable, but how do they wear? Can you tell us a little bit about what you can expect if you buy a frame with leather temples? I've just never seen that before. Absolutely. Um, so this particular is also treated. So with makeup and things like that, it's a little less poor, so your makeup doesn't adhere to it. Um, you can take it on and off uh, without having to worry about it. I'm a CrossFitter, so for me, sweating is a big thing. I have patients that go running in it and so on and so forth. And they take it off and they're like, oh my God, it still looks the same. So leather being a real active ingredient, it absorbs a lot. So we changed ours and treated it to make sure it doesn't absorb your sweat, it doesn't absorb your oil glands, and it's still 
comfortable, but it's, it is definitely uh, unique to men and women. Both can wear it and I've seen them both enjoy it simultaneously. You can expect it to last. That's great. That was, that was a big question. Now let's talk about Seiko, which is what I'm really excited about as well. Um, Personally, I love the energy and excitement of conferences, especially Seiko. And Seiko was the first conference that I ever attended. And mm-hmm. I've been going for 25 years or more uh, with missing one here or there, of course. And we're all excited because this is Seiko's 100th anniversary and Alan Glazier's 25th, maybe. I don't know. They're not <laughs> as exciting. But uh, they always do such a great job on the education historically. And we all go for networking and seeing friends, making connections. and But this year will be more exciting because of that landmark. I can't, there's a ton of special events planned for the 100th. Now tell us about, we'll start by having you tell us about your longstanding relationship with and support for Seco and what it means to you. Absolutely. So just like you said, that was my first one that I had ever been to. So it was the first conventional show that I went to 15 years ago when I first opened my business. Uh, it was magnificent to me. I remember walking in and just what you're saying, that vibe, that energy was infectious to say the least. So I loved it from the first day. Uh, it is a very big part of education, but I love the evolution of Seco. They took ev- the education part of it and continued to grow. The Southeast has never been known for fashion. We've never been known for the place to come to go and purchase eyewear, but Seco changed that. They evolved it into great parties. You know, you have the Roaring Twenties, you have the rap parties now. And then you also have all these incredible designers that realize, oh, the Southeast actually has something to offer when it comes to fashion. They have a lot of cutting edge designs when it comes to designers, as well as equipment, as well as your education. They're constantly evolving their uh, education, as well as giving us new platforms to be on too. Yeah, I, I've noticed they've had a a, fa- a good fashion side compared to most of the optometric conferences. Of course, do you do you feel this year that they've ramped that up even more? Or is it going to be just as usual for Seiko? I think they have done a phenomenal job. They brought in people like Richard Maple and Mel Annis to give it a different um, feel, even more uh, infectious of a revving up, to say the least. And I don't know if I'm getting the right word it down but i do believe this year is going to be very different um it's going to be bigger it's going to be happier it's going to really pour fuel on that hundredth year anniversary that's great that's exciting now for those of you who haven't heard giselle's created a unique special 100 year commemorative frame that's going to be auctioned off at seco this year and the proceeds will go to benefit the als society i think i have that right Yes, sir. Tell us about your charitable efforts on behalf of the ALS Foundation, the auction, and any details that viewers may need to get involved in supporting their effort. Absolutely. And we would love nothing more than the support. Um, the design, the charity, the entire collaboration is extremely close to my heart. Um, the charity proceeds will go to ALS um, for the in the name of Mel Annis. She is a dear friend. And if anyone ever has met El, uh, Mel the way we have known her, she pours all her heart and soul into this. The design of this frame integrates decades of engineering and design into one frame from the 20s to the 30s to the 40s to the 50s to the new generation. Um, we are going to commemorate the 100th anniversary of Seco with me, only 100 of those eyewear. Um, so anyway, you guys can go ahead and support this. It goes to an amazing foundation, but it also is supporting uh, what has supported us for years, which is the Seco 100. That's great. When we get off of the call, you send me a link there to that, and I'll put it up in ODs on Facebook. Where it'll, it will get in front of forty six thousand or more eye care professionals. Uh, oh. That'll boost it as well. Happy to do that, you know. And I look forward to seeing you at Seco Hundred, yes, where the attendees can meet you. Right? Absolutely. Yes, I'll be and there with my whole staff. Maybe try on your fashions and Absolutely. bid on your commemorative frame and all kinds of other exciting stuff. Before we finish here. How can people interested in carrying your frame lines get in touch with you? 
Absolutely. So you can go onto our website. Um, Andy, which is my husband, has been kind enough to be our rep as well. Uh, we try to do everything as green as we can. So you can go on the website and find us. You will see us at SECO. It has been a true honor to be part of this collaboration. Um, and I, I would love to thank Mel Annis, Richard Maple, and the SECO team in general for giving me this opportunity to be part of. Well, it's great to get to know about you, get to know about Andy. What, a, what an amazing guy sounds like. Andy, you're making the rest of the husbands out there look bad, but <laughs> good work. You got to worry about your your house only, so good work there. And uh, I look forward to seeing you at Seco. I'm going to stop by and make a special uh, stop. And uh, anybody else who's out there, let us know. Come on ODs on Facebook, and uh, please consider uh, getting yourself involved in the charity. It's just it's great stuff. So thank you so much. It was great thank to get to you. know you. and. And I'll see you in Atlanta in early March. Yes, sir. It was a pleasure. Thank you so much. And I hope you have a wonderful day. Yeah, you too.